Welcome to this third episode of second part of the course AI uh, at NYU, uh, 11 a.m. New York City live. Before we start, I want to show a book I bought uh, Friday just because why not? Maybe you like it as well. So since in the latest uh, homework, homework five, we've been talking about uncertainty and especially decision making under uncertainty, like we have some rando randomness, randomness going on. I found out this book because I was actually reading the uh, probability website this professor has. Hossein is a professor at UMass. Uh, he has a very nice uh, textbook I'm going to be, I think, getting. And also he has an online version for free uh, you can check out. And also, like on the website, I figured out he wrote this practical uncertainty, which is basically how to uh, implement those ideas that we are teaching uh, to you about making decisions when there is probability and so on. Uh, like when there is uh, randomness, when there is stochasticity in the environment for your for your actual life. Okay, so I don't know. I'm just I just started to reading this. Maybe it's nice. Maybe not. I I hope it is nice. That said, moving forward uh, to today's lesson. So, well, before starting today's lesson, we're gonna be doing a super small recap. What have we seen so far? We start talking about classification. Why is that? Uh, because we've been talking about artificial intelligent agents. And we begin with the uh, knowledge base where we provide information uh, beforehand as like a set of statements. Uh, then we move uh, towards this probabilistic uh, agents where they have a degree of belief over some specific statements. They don't really uh, necessarily hold. Uh, there is just like how much you believe <laughs> something holds. And therefore, we started to see how we can build a probabilistic agent that has a model of the world. So it is a model-based agent. Uh, this model uh, is the full joint probability distribution. We saw in the, in the last episode how to compute all those different probabilities, conditionals, marginals, and so on. I hope you review the content from last class. And because also, of course, it's in the, in the homework as well. And then we saw uh, how we could use that knowledge uh, of the entire, there's not, nothing on the screen. Yes, there is me on the screen, uh, on the camera. And then we saw how to um, uh, use that knowledge that is the full joint probability to ask questions. Uh, the questions we were asking was, which one is the class with the highest uh, probability given that we observe the features? So how do we compute the full joint? Full joint is many, 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 many parameters. We decided to use the naive base approximation, which allows us to compute the full joint simply as the multiplication of all those probabilities. When can we compute a joint from a multiplication? When those probabilities are independent or in, that, in this specific case are conditionally independent, which, which means given the cause, given the class, we assume that all the features are independent Therefore, we can compute the full joint as the multiplication of all those terms. Is this assumption true? Yes, I know the screen is blank. You should be seeing me here moving my hands in the screen in the air, right? So if you split your monitor in two parts, half of the monitor, there is a crazy guy with pink background moving his hands. The other black, other part is black screen. So we said we create this full joint. You should see my hands. Full joint, which is this kind of... Uh, you know, probability mass associated to all possible combination of these variables. There are way too many slots in this probability mass, right? We, we learned that this probability, full joint probability table is like this huge table with small, small, small uh, mini buckets where we put some weight inside based on the likelihood of each event. It turns out that this huge table for this specific case is too large. So we don't know exactly how to put all the uh, weights inside. Therefore, we decided to use the naive Bayes approximation, which allows us to uh, fill in these gaps, maybe by row, right? It's kind of uh, allows us to uh, simplify the, the creation of this table. Finally, and then I show you the slides so you're happy. Finally, uh, how do we use this table? What do we use this table for? And classification. What is this classification? Remind me in the, in the chat. How do we compute the winning target? How do we know? How do we estimate if something is a three? versus a four or a seven, given what? What did we see last time? In the chat, type. 
We find the log probability. That's very good, right? So we find the log joint, right? How do we find the log joint? So the probability, the full joint was the multiplication of all those things. If you multiply many small terms, you might uh, go underflowing, like under underflow the, the smallest number. Therefore, we switch to the logarithm space where we can sum up negative numbers. Why the numbers are negative? I mean, why are we summing up negative numbers when we talk about uh, in last class? I hope it makes sense. Tell me. Because, of course, probabilities are from this fantastic. You're understanding. Good. So we sum a lot of negative numbers. In Later on the class, since I don't like negative numbers, we're going to be flipping everything. Okay. Uh, so we sum negative numbers to get this kind of full joint where we basically replace the sum or random variable with what we observe, right? And the features that we observe. Finally, uh, once we finish summing, what do we have? We have a number per class, right? Which is the log joint for each of the, okay. And then the question, which one is the winning class? How do we pick the winning uh, option? Is there any other benefit other than preventing underflowing to use log instead of multiplication? I I, I sum numbers easier than I multiply them. I, I know how to, uh, yeah, so you can actually, uh, taking sum is easier than taking multiplication, right? Uh, but on the other side, you have to switch to go through the logarithm, right? Unless you store those numbers as logarithms, then you don't need to actually switch. So you actually can spare computations, right? Uh, addition is a single cycle operation, uh, if I'm not mistaken. The multiplication requires multiple. Okay, it, it used to require multiple, but then if you use the uh, more recent hardware, may, maybe also there is an uh, easier way to perform multiplication as well. The higher number, right? So very good. So the point was that um, we don't even have to go back to the probability realm. We can just take the largest number, and that is our and guess if you want the probability you can go back the question that we don't may not answer today but the question is do we actually need to go back to probabilities mm. that's why maybe in the second part of the maybe i will introduce something else in the in in the in a few lessons okay but yeah that's a good question right i mean do we actually have to go back to probabilities mm. we don't know maybe not all right that said, where we left off last 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 time, last time you were basically doing all these computations and so on, and everyone is following, so I'm very happy. With these magic numbers, where are these magic numbers coming from? We don't know yet. I mean, maybe I told you a little bit, but we are supposed not to know, and today we're covering this part. I apologize in advance, it's going to be a little bit mathematical. We take a few derivatives today. I hope it's going to be painless uh, for, for, for the rest of the, <laughs> of the class. If you don't follow, as usual, complain. I try my best to explain what's going on. All right, let me now share the slide so you're happy and you don't have any more this black screen in front of your nose. All right, parameter estimations. So we would like to figure out where to get those tables of numbers we used last time. Remember when we were summing all these log probs and so on? We had these numbers and we would like to figure out where they are coming from. So machine learning, finally, we learn these, these numbers from data. How does it work? We are going to be estimating the distribution of a random variable. Okay, let, let's start easy with a simple case where we actually picking out candies from a uh, from a bag or uh, balls from a urn, like uh, Ernie said last part of the semester. But we like more candies, I think. Elicitation, basically, we can ask a, a, a human maybe, uh, what is this magic number? Why is it hard? I don't know where how the human can come up with this number. Otherwise, we have a more principled way, which is going to be empirically, we just use the training data. We just have a lot of samples and we figure out how many of these samples are supposed to be one type or the other. All right, so we said, for each outcome X that I basically pick it out, I look at the empirical rate of the value okay so now we are checking the frequencies and then we're going to figure out why these two things are actually connected and how uh so for example i pick three three candies well they are colored candies we have uh, cherries and i don't know uh, blueberry <laughs> no raspberry and blueberry right so you actually have the rmb so we have two raspberries and one blueberry okay good we are going to be defining for the moment this PML, which is this probability, uh, maximum likelihood probability. But let's uh, tell you in a second uh, what is this ML. So this probability for the specific X, yeah, maximum likelihood. We're going to be this in the title and I'll cover that in a few lines. Okay. 
not not machine learning maximum likelihood in the title right <laughs> i don't know if it's a joke i hope i think it's a joke yes no worry, don't worry all right so we figure out this probability we are for, we are defining it for the moment right now we are saying that the probability is going to be the count of how many red candies you have over the total can number of candies okay so this count X means how many raspberries candies do you have in your sample here out of total number of candies? Ah, yeah, it's April 1st, right? <laughs> okay, usually I make pranks for my students on April 1st. Today I can, maybe maybe something happens, I don't know. All right, so the probability for the, the red, the raspberry is gonna be two thirds because I had two raspberry candies out of three candies. And then this is the actual estimate that maximizes the likelihood of the data. What does this mean? Okay, now let's figure this out and especially figure out the, this very annoying notation that you're gonna be introducing. I didn't create a notation, I would have chosen something else, but this is how it works. So the likelihood is a function of theta, the entirety of our parameters, given the observed data. So we observe this specific set of choices, two red and one blue. So this likelihood function of the uh, parameter theta is going to be defined as the actual probability for the set of random variables x, okay? x is bold. So the, the proper definition is the following. The likelihood function is the joint probability mass of, uh, of observed data. So this is the probability of the data, okay? View as a function of the parameters of the statistical model. So it's the probability of the data seen as a function of theta. That's why it's written in this uh, or horrible way here on the left hand side. Okay. But this is not the, the it's not the probability of theta, right? And this is a probability of X parameterized, we can say, by theta. Okay. Let me see the, the chat here. Uh, you should have pretended. We, okay. I, I know. No, I am having pretended to have exams is a bit too. <laughs> Too harsh. Usually, I had one April first April. I had my bear starting to move uh, actually in class. Uh, okay, sorry. What does theta represent? Theta is all the parameters that mo our model has. The things we'd like to learn. If the function is for x, okay. So the function is function of theta, given that we observe some specific data, and this function is the probability of observing the data. Okay. All right. And so how do we compute this? OK, so we assume that each data point is sample uh, independently and, and, and has an identical distribution. So we just sample multiple of these things. Since all of these things are uh, um, independent, we multiply the probability for each uh, observed datum, OK, single element of data. So if I have like this candy thing, right, which you can think also being the head tail of a coin. OK, so let's say that the probability of observing the, the raspberry is going to be theta. And then the probability of observing the, uh, the blueberry is going to be one minus theta. Can you tell me what is the probability of observing two raspberries and one blueberry in this specific order? Do we know what is? So we have to multiply the probability of each of them. The first probability, how much is it, right? The probability for the red guy is going, it's written here, which is going to be the uh, the red one, which is going to be theta. Then I had uh, to multiply the probability for the second item, which is going to be again theta. And then I have the probability for the third item, which is going to be one minus theta. Theta squared, so yeah, that's correct, right? So this is what we get uh, here. This is the probability of having this specific data set. Now we're going to be considering this one. So this is, uh, as written here, is this probability over here, right? So this, so far we already knew. All I'm saying right now is that we call this one the likelihood of the data when we consider it a function of the parameter theta. Okay. Now we would like to figure out how to make this probability maximum, right? How to make this data is the most likely data that we can get based on this parameter, right? So we would like to solve this problem, make maximize this function in uh, as a function of theta, such that the data we observe is the most likely coming from this specific uh, probability distribution. So let's do this together. So data 
capital D is our random variable. Our data set is a random variable uh, and has a specific observed lowercase d as usual, okay? Uh, we have H heads and then we have capital T tails, okay? Or raspberries or blueberries, whatever you want. Uh, then we assume we are using this binomial distribution, this co uh, coin flip. Uh, we would like to learn this theta such that, again, it maximizes the, this function. So what is the objective function? What is that we are trying to ma uh, maximize? So this is our likelihood, which is, again, the probability of observing this specific data set with our parameters. And therefore, as we just, uh, you pointed out here in the chat, you're going to be multiplying, well, as many thetas as the number of heads. So this alpha head is the count of heads. Uh, alpha is, the, is a count, okay? Uh, and then one minus theta uh, exponentiated to the count of tails, okay? Once again, this is the probability of observing this specific data set with our parameters. Sweet. Uh, maximum likelihood estimate means that we're going to be choosing theta. So we would like to figure out what value of theta makes this probability for lowercase d the largest. How do we do that? So we simply would like to compute the arc maximum, therefore the value for which this likelihood is the largest which is exactly the same is computing the theta for which this probability is the largest. So the hat on top of the theta, the, the thing means it's the highest, high most, okay? It, it points upwards. Later on in the course, we're gonna be also seeing the check when we perform minimization. In this case, we perform uh, maximization. So we have the hat pointing up. So we said we'd like to figure out is the same, right? By definition here. But the interesting thing is that since uh, the logarithm is monotonic, then we can actually put inside a logarithm here. Why do I like logarithms? We know why we like no logarithms. Because this P is a product of two exponentiated terms. If you compute the log of these things, many things just simplifies. And since this is a monotonic function, taking the arg max of a function or the arg max of a function that goes through a monotonic function doesn't change, okay? If you don't know these things, doesn't matter. If you know them, good. If you already seen this, now you see why it matters. Okay, not, not too, too important. All right, so let's actually do these steps together. We would like to find out this value for which this log probability is the maximum. And I can replace here what is this P that we just computed before, which is going to be this theta to the number of heads multiply by one minus theta to the count uh, of tails. We can set the derivative to zero and then solve it, okay? So what happens if you set the derivative to zero? When, when is derivative zero of a function? We, we took calculus, yes? <laughs> Get the local, okay, very good, very good. Okay, we know, we know. The, 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 yeah, right, so those are called the extrema, right? Very good, very good, okay, sweet. We know. Okay, that's good. I didn't know what oh, critical points, actually. Thank you. Uh, that was the correct name, James. Thanks. All right, sweet. Moving forward then. All right, so we take the uh, derivative with respect to theta of this log p. I replace the uh, p with the uh, expression up above. So I have the uh, um, derivative with respect to theta of the log of this multiplication. The log of the multiplication becomes the sum of the logs, okay? And then the exponential just falls down, right? So the exponential falls in front, the exponential from here falls in front. Then this exponential is a scalar, so I can, uh, since the derivative is a linear function, the derivative of the uh, linear combination of these two logs, it is the same as the linear combination of the two derivatives of the logs, right? So the alpha pops out, I have the derivative of the log plus alpha pops out, derivative of the other log. And now you know that the log, again, this is natural logarithm, is going to be one over theta. Therefore, we're gonna get uh, alpha h over theta. And then on the other case, we're gonna be getting one over one minus theta. That's, we get this second term here. And then finally, uh, if I try to sum these two terms together, I multiply the two things underneath and I also group the numerator by theta because it's gonna be convenient. Uh, 
And so we have one times alpha H, then minus, I have alpha T and plus alpha, uh, alpha H, okay, with the minus in front. All right, so far, just calculus. Now we would like to figure out what is the local maximum. Uh, so here, uh, I use this symbol to represent the fact that I set, uh, it's a setting, uh, I set this expression equals zero, okay? It's not an equality. Uh, in math, we have kind of the equal means too many things, okay? In this case, I set that to be equal zero. So if you set this equal zero, I can simply get this stuff on the right-hand side, and then I can get theta equal alpha h divided by the sum of the two, okay? And so here you get that the estimate uh, that basically is the parameter which maximizes the uh, probability of observing that specific Bernoulli uh, data set is going to be the uh, fraction, the empirical fraction, you see the number of heads over the total number of counts, okay? That's why in the previous slide, I wrote that this the maximum likelihood probability for the specific uh, color, uh, red or blue, is going to be the empirical rate, okay? So this is the empirical rate, and it turns out that the maximum likelihood solution for theta is the one that actually gives us the empirical rate, okay? So this is just a justification, okay? We are not gonna be testing you on this stuff, uh, I think, right? But the point is that what we are showing you here actually has some uh, sort of backing, uh, mathematical backing, okay? So all we're going to be doing is going to be computing frequencies, and computing frequencies is the right thing to do, okay? And that's the major uh, takeaway of this part of the class. All right, sweet. So how do we estimate the conditional probability tables? Oh, yeah. So maximum likelihood, cool, uh, which corresponds to counting. We just saw that. Sweet. Uh, we need to be careful though. Uh, why is that? Hmm, let's figure out what can be going wrong. Something can be going very wrong. So here we can have a, a very funny example of a oversized or overfitting <laughs> hat for this, our little cute robot, a correct fitting or a underfitting. Okay, so this is, okay, a very funny uh, slide. Anyway, so here our robot, underfit robot, is going to be trying to figure out whether uh, what it looks at here is going to be a two or a three, okay? So how, what is the procedure that we covered last time? How do we, com how do we figure out if it's a two or if it's a three? We have to compute the, well, how, how did we make classification with uh, a probabilistic model last time? We have to compute what first? James is suggesting to multiply all the vectors to get the joint probability. Let's do that, what James suggests. So we're going to be starting with the first feature. Um, oh, actually, no, well, we have to actually start from the prior, right? So we forgot the prior, <laughs> me included. So first of all, we start with the prior. Okay, the prior, we forgot it because it's uh, equal prior across the entire classes, right? We have 10 classes. Each of them are going to be having 0.1 assigned, okay? Sweet. So then we're going to be starting with the first feature. For example, in this case, uh, both the two, right? If you write a two or if you write a three, both of them will start here somehow, right? And so both the probability for uh, this specific feature being on for class two and class three, both of them is going to be 0.8, okay? Then we're going to be moving to the second feature. For example, in this case, for the Two, it's unlikely that this pixel is on, right? Because if I write a two, maybe it's going to be like going this way and I never actually get here. Or maybe very, only if I have a very skew kind of two, right? So I can get here, but most of the time, uh, just one, 10% uh, of the times I get here, this pixel on. Instead for the three, I get this pixel is on basically 90% of the times, right? Because most of the trees will get this pixel uh, hit on, okay? Sweet, so so far who's winning? Three, okay, very good. All right, moving forward. 
Uh, then I get this point here. Uh, this also, I guess, is not very on for the two because, again, I, I don't really get there. So that's very low, 10%. And maybe it's larger for three because, I don't know, maybe the, someone writes the three with a, with a curly thing, okay? More common than the two. So still the three is uh, winning. Uh, then, uh-oh. <laughs> we never seen this pixel on. So this pixel had exactly zero count. Therefore, the probability that the we give to this specific pixel is zero. What, what, what happens here? What happens if I have a zero here? Who can spot this? And don't, you don't have to copy the every other person answer. Uh, no, we choose two. Yes, why do we choose two? Yeah, the total probability is zero for the right hand side, right? So this is a disaster, right? You can see this. If you actually uh, hit a zero here, everything that is above gets completely ignored and the zero just brings to zero the whole multiplication, right? And so the fact that, first of all, how we got a zero here? How did we, yeah, first question I'm asking you, how did we get this zero here? No one sees anything. Anomaly. No, it's not. An, okay. Well, no, it's not an anomaly. The zero, the empirical data. Good, good, Edison. Okay. Uh, the point is that we never, okay, better question, right? More specific. Hold on. Stop typing. Listen to the question. Um, how do we get these numbers? We, we just, I just explained in the previous slide, these numbers are coming from the empirical data. How, how do we compute these numbers? We don't know. Counts. That, that's good, Edison. Yes. So all these numbers are coming from the counts. And then the fact that I have a zero here means that number three, like the, the class three, never experienced having this feature here activated. Okay. Therefore, I'm going to get a zero. The issue with having a zero probability is that it's going to take down the whole multiplication. Or if you switch to the log space, this is going to be minus infinity. So it's going to be boom, pushing you to minus infinity, regardless of where you were. Maybe you were winning, right? You were the highest number. Now, boom, everything gets broken. Um, whereas on the left hand side, it's not that bad, right? Because it's still 0.01, it makes things smaller, but it doesn't make them zero, right? So this is very, 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 very bad. And this is example of overfitting, although the picture is underfitting. That's very annoying uh, picture. Okay, overfitting, right? <laughs> what does it mean? We overfit on the on the on the noise on the data uh, on the data set. So what do you do in this case? That's a very good question, Ethan. Let's figure out what to do in this case. Two wins. No. Okay. So before I answer your question, let's also see a few of these uh, interesting things. So let's take the ratio between the probability that our model gives to specific words for the ham as ratio with the probability that the same model gives to the same word for spam, okay? So in this case, what are those infinity mean? Can you tell me? What are these words? What are these uh, words here? What can I use these words? What can I use? Yes, that's good, Raul. So what can I use this word for? What can I use this word for if I am a hacker? Oh, yes, that's good, Brian. I can guarantee that the email will be always classified uh, as being uh, ham, right? So if you write a spam, but then you include, seriously, <laughs> it will automatically get routed to... Uh, to, to the ham, okay? Sweet. On the other side, uh, I have the counter, uh, the opposite, right? So if I ask you, <laughs> please, or someone asks me, please, can I have your signature for my, uh, for my something? And <laughs> it's gonna be automatically routed to, uh, this is so bad, right? It's gonna be automatically routed to spam. This is a disaster, I think, but <laughs> okay. So how do we fix disaster? Let's get back to Ethan's question. Uh, okay. Oh, another example. Sorry, I don't know the order of my slides. Okay, one more slide and I get there. Uh, in this case, we can see this, all these points could have like a nice, uh, maybe parabola uh, approximating them. 
But then if you actually uh, use a higher order polynomial to actually approximate these points, you're going to get something that is like this, which is very wiggly, right? Um, this is to also show overfitting. If you're taking uh, a model that is too capable, it's going to be basically trying to fit the data, the training data. It's going to be hitting many points, but then this stuff doesn't really look like our kind of smooth function that, I mean, assumingly, is the one that generates this data. All right, how do we actually detect this, right? We had to figure out first how we make sure we are not making these mistakes in practice. So first we train our model, okay? We teach uh, how what are apples, what are cars. Then we have practice exams. That's why you have homework, right? Maybe. And then we have the final exam such that you can actually try the, your knowledge. All right. So the data has some, some label instances, for example, emails marked as spam or ham. And I had to make three uh, sets. I had to make a training set. I had to make a held out set. And then I use a test set for the final evaluation. In this way, I can evaluate my model uh, that is trained on the training set on the held out set to see whether uh, it's doing well or not on data that has not been seen before. Finally, we report the, the grade on the testing set. So features are the attribute value pairs, which characterize each X. Uh, the experimentation cycle goes this way. So first we learn the parameters. So we estimate, for example, in this case, these probability counts on the training set. Then we tune some hyperparameters, which I'm going to introduce in the next slide on the held out set such that we avoid getting those very dangerous zero mass uh, probability. Uh, then we compute the accuracy on the test set. It's very, very, very important not to peak uh, at the test set. Otherwise, you pollute your judgment, right? You cannot. Evaluation. For example, we can compute the accuracy, which is the fraction of instances that is correctly predicted. I'm going to be introducing more of this kind of evaluation metrics uh, on Wednesday. Is the held out set the same as validation set? Yes. Uh, although some people use the term validation set for when you do cross validation, which is something with the folding and, but yes, people can call that validation set, dev set, if you're doing not a natural language processing or just uh, in this case, held out set. All of these are more or less uh, synonymous. All right, so overfitting and generalization, uh, we would like to have a classifier which does well on the test data, but we train it on the train data, right? We try to do good on the test, although we train on the train. So we're fitting, we are fitting the training data very closely, but not generalizing very well. So we are just learning by heart uh, all the correct answers. Then I ask you a different question. You have no idea about the answer. Under fitting, you're not listening in class. You're not fitting anything, not even, neither, like it's the opposite, the other way around. Okay, we basically have the fact that the relative frequencies parameters will overfit the data, the training data, because they are basically the estimate of the, okay, why, why, why is the case, right? Why are the, this is actually a good question, I didn't think about it before. Why are the relative frequencies overfitting the training data? You can tell me this actually, uh, because I told you before in two slides ago. Let me try to state the question better. Why, by definition, are relative frequencies overfitting the training data? Okay, that, that's the correct statement. And there is a mathematical answer to this question. So maybe it's a little bit too, 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 too thin. Too, too, okay, let me see. Maybe, maybe someone can figure out. The hint is that I, 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 got, I, tell, I told you the solution just before. The, the point, okay, the hint is where are these frequencies coming from, right? We show, I demonstrated to you, right, in a sec, just before, that the frequencies are, you know, sure, the frequencies are the count, but then this count, I justify the count, right, that, but those counts I show you before, like some five lines of mathematics, right? What, what, what I was showing you before, what was the juice, the main takeaway of the mathematics I showed you before? Remember, I show you five lines or like six slides of math, right? I don't want you to. Okay, let me, should I go back or someone can figure out this? 
Okay, I show you the slide, right? What does this slide, what is the takeaway of this slide? Oh, okay, one, one, more, one moment, parenthesis, right? Someone asked me, oh, are we supposed to take uh, notes in class? Okay, when I was going to class, to school, when I, when, I, when I take a class, I always take notes in class just to, you know, remember what I saw before. And then I can review my notes. I know we have slides, but it makes, uh, I don't know, to me, it makes, uh, it, it helps me remember and it helps me reason on the content if I take notes while I watch something, okay? That was a small uh, thing. Okay, so first question, why are we setting this thing to zero? here on the bottom side. Why are we setting the derivative to zero? What was the point of setting the derivative to zero? To find, okay, very good, okay, okay. So we find the local maxima. What does, the local maxima of what? What is the subject that we are maximizing here? I understand you're trying to, have local maxima of what, what, okay. New question, the maximum likelihood, which is, and what is this likelihood? We define it, the likelihood as being the, what is the definition of the likelihood? The probability of observing that specific, yes, there you go. So why are these, the, the, the point here, why are these counts, uh, these relative frequencies overfit in the data? Because these frequencies, are the exact value that gives you the largest probability for the observe data. What data is this? This is a training data, right? So the relative frequencies are the parameters that maximizes the probability of observing the training data, but we are evaluating on the test data which is not the train data, okay? So this is by the, the mathematical proof, if you want, right? Of the fact that these relative frequencies are overfitting the data, the training data, because those are the parameters that maximize the probability of observing the training data. If we are testing this model on the testing data, it will therefore not be optimal because we by definition, found the parameters that give the maximum probability of the train data. Okay, does it make sense? This is a major, a major point. Actually, I just, <laughs> I just got it. Okay, uh, again, uh, I just got it right now. So, uh, if I would have prepared, maybe I could have expressed myself better. Ethan was asking before how we fix it. Let, let's fix it, right? All right. So, relative frequencies parameters will overfit the training data. Okay, that's important statement because if the arg maximizer of the probability of observing the training data. Just because we never uh, saw the three pixel with the pixel on the corner uh, during training set doesn't mean we won't uh, see it at testing time. Unlikely that every occurrence of minute is 100 spam. If you check the the before we saw one was giving you infinite uh, thing, the other one, I mean, there was seriously, remember if you write seriously, you get automatically classified on the other side. Uh, what about all words that don't occur in the training set? Oh, that's a good question. Someone asked this question last week. I didn't answer him. <laughs> but the same problem right now, if I have a word that I never actually observe, I have a zero probability disaster, okay? What does the relative frequency parameter mean? This, th this thing, relative here, hold on. Uh, this one here, empirical rate, okay? Relative frequency or empirical rate is exactly the same uh, thing. Two different words for the same thing. This is a frequency because it counts how many times something happens. So it's a frequency. So, uh, no, the, the ratio, right? The, the, the frequency is the ratio. So count divided by total thing is the, the frequency. This is relative frequency in, in, in a, you know, you have the Bayesian and the frequencies in probability, okay? Okay, never mind. it's just terminology. So what about all the words that don't occur yet? Yeah, we are screwed. Uh, in general, we can't go around giving unseen events pro zero probability, right? So we cannot possibly assign zero probability. Assigning zero probability makes things go very bad. So as an extreme case, use uh, imaging using the entire email is one feature, right? 
in this case, would get the training data per perfectly, right? It is uh, uh, if the, the labeling is deterministic. If I know exactly that one of those emails uh, came, I know it's 100% spam, but then I will not be able to generalize because we will never observe the same email in the future. It was not, yeah, it wouldn't be generalizing at all. Uh, making the bag of word assumption, the one we just shuffle all the words and just figure out how many times each word appear, gives a sort of generalization, but still it's not good enough. So the point is that we would like now to generalize better by smoothing or regularizing. So in the case I showed you before with the polynomial, we'd like to make it less wiggly, okay? In our case here, we would like to avoid giving zero probability. So how do we avoid giving zero probability? Well, we give some probability, okay? That, that's it, that, that's called Laplace smoothing. <laughs> Nothing more than giving a bit of probability to everyone, so everyone is happy. I'm not, I'm not even joking. That's how, actually how it works. Smoothing. I don't understand this uh, drawing. <laughs> if someone can explain to me later on, I would appreciate it. So unseen events. If we say that the sun rises every day with 100% probability, one day the sun doesn't rise, then everything just breaks. Okay. So we cannot really assign one or zeros. We have to be almost one, almost zero. Let's get back to this, giving a little bit of probability to everyone. Wouldn't that mean the sum of the relative probabilities will be greater than one? No, no, because we sum those plus ones on the denominator as well. Let me let me get to that, Hugo. But the good point. Let me explain the slide, then we can see if this is broken or not. So this is this Laplace estimate. We're going to be uh, counting how many occurrences of a specific uh, raspberry candy plus one, okay? I always observe plus one for each uh, class. So divided by the sum for every class, every possible color here, counts plus one. Or if you take out this plus one from the summing, you had to sum to the total number of observed uh, candies, the number of possible values the candies can take, because we're gonna be summing plus one for each a candy type okay so first question what is the maximum likelihood or what is the relative frequency of this specific uh random variable capital x for its two possible value r and b given that we observe this specific data set two-thirds and two-thirds and one-third, right? Because it sums to one. That's very good. Okay. Now, stop typing. Second question. Stop, stop typing. Right? Second question. What is going to be the Laplace estimate for the same random variable? It's going to be two numbers, right? It's going to be probability distribution for two classes. You have to give me the two numbers for the second uh, thing. Three-fifths and two-fifths. That, that is correct. Okay. And so in this case, basically, we gave one more count for each possible candy, and then we sum two more candies because we have two more classes. Okay. We can also possibly derive this from using fancy Dirichlet clad priors over the parameters, but okay, let's not get there. Okay. Maybe next course, next semester. <laughs> can you explain again why? Yes, I can explain it again. So here, basically, we had to sum plus one for each type of candy, okay? So if I have the two reds, I have to say, so count for the red are gonna be two plus one. So I have three red, okay? Divided by how many uh, candies plus one I have. So I have two for red plus one, and then I have one for blue plus one, okay? So plus one, plus one, I had to do a plus one for every type of candy. Okay, very good. There is like a natural extension of this Laplace estimate, which is instead of summing plus one candies, I will sum plus K candies. So this is the K approximate, uh, K, I don't know how you call it, K Laplace estimate, if you want, right? Does it mean if there are three types of candies, X equal three, yeah, so X, the, the bars on the on the x it tells you that x can take three possible values right so this is a, this is a discrete random variable the the bars tell you how many possible 
uh, values you can take, right? So yes, if we would have x takes three values, then you sum three more. In this case, you're gonna be summing three, three k, three k more, right? In the next homework, I'm gonna ask you to compute these um, probabilities for the for the uh, for a naive Bayes classifier where you have to sum these log probs, I guess. And then I will ask you to fix the, the overfitting with this Laplace uh, approximation. So here we just sum k more things. So is there theory behind how to choose k? Yeah, you try different values and then you use the held out set to figure out uh, the best value, okay? the best uh, amount. That's why we have the held out set. You, so we have the training set where we estimate the probabilities then we can assume uh, we can try different k's and of course every time you you choose any k you're going to get a worse probability for the training set right because the uh, relative frequencies are the arg maximizers of the likelihood and therefore if i choose anything else it's going to be worse so by choosing k anything larger than zero is going to be a worse estimate for the training set but it's going to be a better estimate for the validation and hopefully for the test set. When do we stop? We're going to be stopping when we find the K that has the best accuracy, for example, for my uh, validation, for my held out set. Hopefully, that's going to be also a good choice for my test set. Okay. What is the point of Laplace again? Laplace allows you to... Uh, undo the overfitting. By computing the relative frequencies, you're fitting, uh, as we said here in the previous slide, relative frequencies will overfit the training data. Uh, we said here several options, and I also show you mathematically why is the case. Then if you want to fight overfitting, you have to introduce some smoothing. I haven't yet shown you how this is a uh, smoothing or some regularization. Uh, the point was to avoid getting that zero in the previous slide. Remember here, we got a zero. We got a zero down here. We would like to get rid of this zero. So we assign a little bit of probability to everyone such that no one gets a zero probability. Okay, does it make sense? Okay, very good. So we are afraid, we are scared of the zeros. Therefore, we would like to assign a little bit of mass, probability mass to every possible slot. Okay. Because again, since all these probabilities get uh, are multiplicative, right? We all multi all the time multiply this probability. If you get a zero, the zero will boom break break down. Will take down the whole the whole thing. Okay, so they are very dangerous <laughs> numbers. Okay, good. All right, moving to what the uh, last question I got here. Wouldn't that yeah validation set? So the the, the overfitting basically. For, for what I know is defined for when you find your parameters. So you're when you find find the parameters, right? You search for these parameters. Either you compute them analytically, uh, as in this case, or you use gradient descent and so on. You will use the, the training set to find out the parameters that are the best for the training set. Then you start polluting those uh, parameters such that. It's not exactly the solution for the uh, training set, but it's somehow letting you fit well also the validation set. Hopefully, you expect the test set and the validation set to be very similar. Uh, the point is that you don't train on the, on the held out set. Use the held out set to dose how much poison you want to introduce in your system to prevent fitting the training data. Okay, so. Would you overfit the validation set? I guess not, because we are not fitting the validation set. We are um, hyperfitting, if you want, right? So if that's hyper, hyper, I don't know, over hyperfitting, maybe we can say that, right? So it becomes a little bit uh, extra, right? I'll tell you also a, a little bit another story is like people um, even overfit testing sets uh, these days when you have way too many people that are sending so many contributions and so many iterations, uh, even though you cannot, you don't own the testing set, someone else will give you the, the, the score you, 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 you get, but you can also uh, pollute those after a bit. Okay, how do we train the model? Uh, do we just manually label based on the data we are given? The, so how do we train the model? The model is 
train by computing the relative frequencies in this case, right? We don't train, we just estimate the relative frequencies, okay? So here we uh, went to this generalization of the Laplace smoothing. And now I'm going to explain to you why this is uh, smooth, smoothing, what is smoothing, okay? So K is the strength of the prior, okay? We don't care what the prior is, but again, is the strength of the smoothing. So what is Laplace with K equals zero? The original empirical rate, very good, Alan, all right. So we start here, two third, one third. Then what is uh, K equal one? Basically the one we saw in the previous slide. What is Laplace equal uh, K equal 100? Well, it's gonna be this with 100 inside. So I'm gonna be getting something like 102 over 203 and 101 over 203. <laughs> if you compute these numbers, it's going to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And now finally we understand what's going on. So if you crank up this K, you basically get two numbers that are equal. The more you uh, reduce K and the more you cooling down the system and the system will be able to go to the uh, frozen version, if you want to say that, like the arg max, right? The probability, those two probabilities are the one that are maximizing the likelihood, okay? So this K acts again as a regularizer. The larger, the more flat, the warm the system, the more relaxed the system, the smaller the K, the more hard and more kind of spiky it can get, right? The more uh, overfit. We're gonna be look, talking about hard, cold and, and spiky things soon as well, again. Okay. Um, how do we do this for this conditional? We simply uh, apply this uh, smoothing for each specific class, okay? So that, that nothing, nothing crazy. So for real classification problems, smoothing is critical. Now we can compute this new uh, odd ratio. And now finally we have some uh, ability to actually peek inside this model and see how some choices are made. So now actually it works. And we have that all these things here, uh, Helvetica, Sims, Group, Ago areas had relatively small spam uh, weight and relatively high hem. So these are all terms that are most likely appearing in the hem. Why do we care about ratio here? The ratio allows you to basically figure out what are the words. You can do like some sort of introspection. We can figure out what are the most common words that are actually appearing in a hem, but they are not appearing in spam. Okay. So this is somehow how we can look inside the model, if you want, right? To figure out what are the things that are relevant. On the other case, these numbers are high for, uh, for masses that are larger for the spam and small for the hem. So, if, for example, if you use Verdana, it's likely to be a, a spam. Very few people use uh, Verdana, <laughs> for example, to write ham when this data was collected. Similarly, for credit or order or like using capital font or using money. Okay, so all these numbers here represent uh, probability mass that are you know non-small for the spam and relatively small for the ham. Uh, isn't these numbers are okay? results from the log of the original probabilities no these numbers are the probability ratio oh and one light just died okay uh no these are the probability ratio okay these numbers are the rel relative frequencies that were smoothed if you don't smooth then you get these the numbers that i showed you before this is what was happening before we got infinities because we were assigning zero prob probability to something, and therefore it was exploding everything. Now that we are uh, smoothing a little bit, we actually have some more reasonable words that have large ratios, right? Pro uh, re probability ratios are uh, used rather often, actually. All right, so tuning. Maybe we actually finished this deck of slides there. Yes, two more slides, then I'll let you go. So tuning. Tweak omatic. Okay, cool. I like this slide. So how does it work? So now we've got two kinds of unknown parameters. Hmm. Either the frequencies, empirical probabilities for the features given the specific class, and then these the priors. And then we had the hyperparameters. For example, the amount and type of smoothing. So K, right? 
I think alpha was the count. I don't know why it's here. Okay. So basically, on the training set, we can always, if you lower the K, you're going to be increasing the accuracy of the training, obviously, right? Because if you have K0, you have that the, you, you maximize the, the probability of observing your training data. But the point is that with the maximum probability for the training data, the probability for the validation data and test data would be actually lower. Now, if you uh, increase a little bit the K, which is basically if you warm up the system, you make it, uh, you smooth out those probabilities, then you actually can recover and co come up this point here. Uh, when you stop for the held out, somehow you're higher the, for the test than when you actually are down here. Is the highest point of the held out the same as the test? Not necessarily, but it's still higher than where we started. So we can have a nice uh, indication for where to stop with this K, okay? How is the held out curve different from the test curve? Shouldn't both be originally inaccessible while training? Uh, so the test, we don't use it, right? We use the held out and the training set. Here I'm showing you uh, different runs for different case. And I, I show you that the test and held out more or less agree, okay? But we cannot make decisions based on the performance of the test set. That would be very bad. You take decisions only on the held out or validation set, which is the green curve. Here, all the three curves are shown such that you can compare performance for all the three uh, cases. This is for learning, for teaching you how this works, okay? Good question. What should we learn where? We are going to be learning the parameters from the training data. Then we tune the hyperparameters on the held out data. Why? Otherwise you overfit. For each value of the hyperparameters, train and test on the held out. Choose the best value and then finally uh, test on the test data, but don't use this data to do any uh, decision. Otherwise, you are not using test data, you're just using validation or held out data. All right, so uh, important tips actually. First step actually, always, I say this, this to my students too, get a baseline, okay? Even the most stupid, stupid baseline is a baseline. So baselines are very simple straw man procedures help determine how hard the task is. It helps also to know what a good accuracy is, right? So weak baseline, for example, you can choose the most frequent label classifier. So you can give all test instances, whatever label was most common in the training set. For example, in our spam and ham classifier, you can classify everything as ham. It was two thirds for ham, one third for spam. So the lowest accuracy, the most stupid data, uh, classifier can do is going to be 66%. You cannot do lower than 66. 66 is classifying everything as ham, and then you get 66%. Now, if you got, if you can, you can get better. You actually are managing to do something good, useful. Uh, accuracy might be very high if the problem is cute. We learn about this uh, Wednesday. Uh, for example, calling everything ham gets 66%, as I told you. So a classifier that gets 70% is not quite good, right? Uh, for real research, uh, usually we use previous work as a strong baseline, right? Usually you want to beat uh, state of the art. Okay, so what have we learned today? So today we learned about Bayes rule. Well, today in these last three lessons, we learned about a Bayes rule that allows us to switch the diagnostic queries from the causal queries. The naive Bayes assumption allows us to take all features as independent given the class label. This allows us to create that jo full joint probability by summing all these log probabilities. Otherwise, it would be really, 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 really hard to estimate. Uh, we can build uh, classifiers out of a naive base model, again, that we, we train with using the training data, doing this kind of uh, computation of the relative frequencies. But then it's really important not to uh, just use those relative frequencies because you can observe zeros. If you observe zeros, everything just uh, breaks. 
Uh, and moreover, these relative frequencies are basically the values that are maximizing the likelihood of observing the training data. But we would like to perform well on the validation set. Therefore, we need to smooth the system. We need to make it a bit warmer. And for example, in this case, we have this K uh, hyperparameter, which allows us to smooth all those probability and make them like no more spiky. Okay. And so this, that was pretty much uh, the end of today's lesson. So we have four minutes more for questions that I haven't answered that you might have uh, asked. So do you have questions or anything about today, today or the previous two lessons? Everything was clear, crystal clear. Well, you've been asking a lot of things, so I'm, I'm happy that you interact a lot. Uh, this algorithm wouldn't perform well if the pixels are translated or scaled, right? <laughs> absolutely. Uh, this is absolutely not to be used, neither for spam classification nor pixels, right? And with the scaling, even convolutional net don't do very well. But with the translation, they, we don't have a problem there. All right, so that is pretty much the end of the class. Thank you for so much for your attention. I see you on Wednesday for the fourth episode of this class, and then I stick here for a few more questions that someone wants to ask, okay? Bye-bye, enjoy lunch. <laughs>